Let us continue our worship in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are seated on your throne in heaven. Your throne is based on righteousness, truth, faithfulness, faithfulness, and love. We praise you. Father, we confess that we are sinners. We do not love you above all. Our hearts often fail to honor you, to give the love that you deserve from us. We put our, our identity in things on earth more than we put our identity in you. Our hearts are satisfied more on the things of the earth than in you. For that, we are sorry. We thank you, Christ, that you have come to die for our sins, especially during Christmas season, to remember you have sacrificed, left the glory and comfort of heaven to come and humble yourself to die for us, to send us the Holy Spirit to empower us. We thank you for that. Hallelujah. You have set us free. You have broken every chain. Holy Spirit, we pray that you will strengthen us, that you will strengthen us through your word. Help us be satisfied. Continue to taste the glory, the truth, the joy of living in the kingdom of God at this moment as we commune with God, as we commune with fellowship with other believers, as we obey you. Empower us. Help us to obey in our joy and love. Father, we also pray for this time, Christmas season, as we celebrate with our families and our friends. We pray that the gatherings will be honoring to you, that we would, if there's any conflict, we would solve all conflicts through Christ's likeness, through patience, through humility, love, gentleness, and kindness, and truth. We pray that our gatherings will honor you and that we would remember to celebrate and honor you and not just about presence. We also pray that, Lord, you help us to be cognizant of those around us, to humble ourselves that we may associate with the lowly who do not have the gospel. May we show the love of Christ by sharing the gospel with him, by sharing the love of Christ. We also pray for this nation, Father, that you will protect your people as we gather this morning to worship and honor you, that you will prevent any terrorist attacks, that you protect us, and that you would thwart the plans of the evil people in this country. Father, we pray that now you will prepare our hearts to listen to your word, to renew our minds so that we may become more and more like Christ and that fill our hearts with joy as we celebrate and honor you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Merry Christmas. It is a unique day to have Christmas Day on the Lord's Day. Praise God. I hope that you will have a wonderful time to celebrate God's love through Christ. Now, this morning, we're going to do something a bit different. Okay? At the end of the sermon, I'm going to give some time to allow you to ask some questions. So as I preach, be thinking about what kind of questions you want to ask. If there's something that wasn't clear or you want more explanation, you can ask me that. But please, don't ask any questions that's not related to the passage for the sermon. Okay, if you want to do that, you can come after the service and ask me, okay? So just as I preach, uh, be thinking about good questions to ask. Uh, please turn your Bible to Matthew 1, uh, verse 18 to 25. Last week, Yusuf looked at Jesus in the Old Testament before his incarnation. So this week, we will look at Jesus' incarnation in the New Testament. Now, recently, a survey was conducted by Lifeway and Ligonier Ministry America. And the survey is designed to see what evangelicals believe on various critical doctrines of the Bible. And the survey was conducted by 
making statements and asking participants to agree or disagree with these statements. And one of the statements says this, Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. And shockingly, 43% of evangelicals, Christians in America, agree with that statement. Two years ago, only 30% of evangelicals agree with this statement. So Americans are increasingly denying the deity of Christ. Now, I don't know how Indonesian Christians will answer this statement, but I know that everything happens in America tends to be exported to here, to the rest of the world. And there are a lot of Katepe Christians, so I would not be surprised if a lot of Christians deny the deity of Christ in Indonesia. This is one of the reasons why we want to do this two-part mini-series, because we really want to emphasize on the deity of Christ during this Christmas season. It's so critical to Christianity. If you deny the deity of Christ, you deny the heart of Christianity as revealed in the Bible. If Jesus is just a human being and not God, then there's no salvation for us. No human being can die for another person's sin. Only a person who is 100% God, 100% man, can die for the sins of the world, for the sins of sinners. So in light of this shocking denial of the deity of Christ, it's fitting for us during this Christmas season to be reminded of the importance of the deity of Christ and how this important doctrine is connected to other important doctrines. Now before we read this passage, let us remind ourselves of the context of Matthew 1. Remember the Gospel of Matthew, the main theme is about Jesus is the divine Messiah as prophesied in the Old Testament, the son of David, who's going to establish God's kingdom on earth as prophesied in the Old Testament. Everything in, the, in this Gospel of Matthew is trying to support this main theme. And before our passage, the genealogy of Jesus was given in chapter 1. And this shows that God has fulfilled his promise, his prophecy, that the Messiah will come through the bloodline of Abraham and David. You see, ever since the colossal collapse of mankind in Genesis 3, the Jewish people, since the time of Abraham, has been waiting for the Messiah for almost 2,000 years. They're waiting for 2,000 years to get the Christmas gift. Can you imagine waiting for 2,000 years to get your Christmas gift? My kids can't even wait for two days to get their Christmas gift. And when they get it, they're extremely happy. Can you imagine how happy the Jewish people will be when they read about the narrative of Jesus' birth? The genealogy here is supposed to remind them that they're supposed to read this with great excitement and joy. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to read this passage with great excitement and joy in Matthew 1, verses 18 to 25. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When, Jesus, when, jo- when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, this passage 
tells us that there are two purposes for Jesus' birth. But before we look at these two, pur- two uh, purposes, let's examine the incarnation of Jesus first in Matthew 18 to 20. Now Mary, Jesus' mother, was from the bloodline of David. The genealogy in Matthew 1 traces the genealogy of Joseph, Jesus' legal father. But in in Luke 3, it it traces the genealogy of Mary, who is also from the line of David. This is to fulfill God's prophecy that the Messiah will will be from the line of David. Now, when Mary was old enough to be married, she was betrothed to Joseph. This means that they were engaged. And typically, back then, girls were engaged when they're about 14 to 20 years old. So Mary was probably around that age, probably 16 or 17. And then, typically, males would be engaged about 18 to 20. So that's how old Joseph was. Now, I know it's really difficult to imagine how these young adults could be married, you know? Uh, back then, kids mature faster. They were ready for marriage because they were given more responsibilities back then. It's not like us. I can't even take care of a dog at this age. So they, they were mature enough to marry. That was very common uh, back then. Now, back then, when, they were, when someone was betrothed, it's not like engagement now. When they were betrothed, they were legally actually married. The only exception is that they did not have the wedding ceremony, which would take place in one year. They did not live together, and they did not have sexual relationship. That's the difference. They were legally married. But before Joseph and Mary came together, the tax says, which means before they lived together, had sexual relationships, Mary was found to have a child through the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Luke 1 tells us more details about how all this happened, but Matthew does not give us more details. And after a while, Mary's pregnancy became obvious because, because her stomach was big, so she couldn't hide her pregnancy anymore. Joseph eventually found out, and, she thought, and he thought that she was an ungodly woman, so he wanted to divorce her. Since he was a righteous man, he must divorce her. You must understand that back then, the culture demanded that a person divorce an ungodly, promiscuous woman. If he does not do that, then it will ruin his reputation and the reputation of his family. So he wanted to do that. But Joseph was also a compassionate person. He didn't want to hurt Mary even more. He didn't want to cause even more suffering to her. Because back then, when you are considered an ungodly woman, promiscuous woman, nobody would ever marry her again. And this was devastating for a woman. Because back then, a woman's livelihood is dependent on the husband. So it was devastating to her. But Joseph was a compassionate man. He did not want to cause uh, more trouble, more suffering to her. So he decided to... Divorce him, uh, divorce her, um, in a in a not a public way in a courtroom, but in a private way, in front of two or three witnesses. That's what it means by doing it privately. And as he was considering this, God intervened in a miraculous way by sending an angel of the Lord to speak to him in a dream, and he revealed in the dream to him that Mary is not an ungodly person. The child is from the Holy Spirit. This is what we call the incarnation. God the Son took on a human body through the work of the Holy Spirit. Interestingly, Quran, in Islam, Quran also believed that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. But except they believe that the Holy Spirit is the angel Gabriel. That's kind of interesting how an angel could do that. But... Obviously, we disagree with that. We believe that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. So this passage is clear that Jesus is divine, God himself. He's 100% God, 100% human. He's not 50% God, 
God, 50% human. Now, a lot of people have asked me, how can this be possible? How can Jesus take on a human body and become 100% God and 100% man? Now, this is a mystery. We cannot fully understand it completely, but we can understand it a little bit. And I believe that the best way to understand this is through an illustration. Now, have you ever seen a person getting into a robot, a giant robot, and controlling the robot from within that robot. Not from without, with a remote control, but stepping in into a robot and controlling the robot. If you haven't seen that, you could actually go on a YouTube and check out these robots having competitions and fighting with each other, okay? And what happens was, is this. When the person goes into a robot, that person doesn't become 50% robot and 50% human. He's 100% human and 100% robot, so to speak. And he begins to express his personhood through a robotic nature. The person even walks and moves like a robot. He even talks like a robot through the speakerphone. And the robot, when, when the robot gets hit and falls down, Guess what happened to the person? He also feels the hit and the fall. Okay. This is exactly what the incarnation of Jesus is like. Jesus, when he took on a human body, he does not become 50% God and 50% man. He's 100% God and 100% human. And he starts to, the Son of God starts to express his divine personhood through a human nature. When that human body becomes thirsty, he feels the thirst. When that human body gets hit and falls down, he feels the hit and falls down. And this is exactly what it's like in the incarnation. Now, if a human being can create a robot and enter into that robot, is it possible for God to create a human being, a human body, and enter that human body? Yeah, of course. Of course it's possible. It's very possible. And that's exactly what Christ has done for us. I hope the analogy helps you understand the incarnation better and strengthen your faith. Jesus is God. And this doctrine is critical to our salvation. And it's critical to other important doctrines in the Bible. And we will see these connections in the following verses in verse 21. Now, as God spoke to Joseph through the angel, he revealed to Joseph two purposes of Jesus' incarnation. And the first purpose is to fulfill God's promise of salvation. This is in verse 21. Now, God commanded Joseph to name the child Jesus. The name Jesus is the Greek version of the Hebrew name Joshua. And it means salvation. God is salvation. Jesus is named after that because he is salvation for us. He will save his people from their sins. God will give us, uh, Jesus will give us, uh, uh, to save us from our sins by dying on the cross as a substitute to pay for the penalty of sin that we deserve so that we can be united with God and his people in his eternal kingdom. The necessity of Jesus dying for our sins is clearly communicated in the Old Testament. God instituted a system of sacrifices to teach the Jews that God is a holy, righteous God who must judge sinners or else he's not a righteous judge. You see, after the colossal collapse of mankind in Genesis 3, Every human being is born with a sinful nature. And this sinful nature causes human beings to rebel against God constantly. And the just penalty of our sin is death and separation from God. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of love is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our brothers and sisters, that is the gospel. If you have never communicated that message, you have never communicated the gospel. 
Now, we can use different methods as a bridge or as an introduction to the gospel. But we must share the gospel eventually, or else we are not being faithful witness for God. Forgiveness of sin and the ability to enter God's kingdom is the heart of the gospel. And sadly, most Christians in the U.S., and I'm sure in many parts of the world, do not even believe that people are born sinful. According to the same survey by Lifeway and Ligonier, 65% of evangelicals believe that everyone is born innocent in the eyes of God. That's 65%. That's shocking. Now, can a person with a sinful nature be a decent human being according to human standards, which is low, if, it's, if the person is given the right environment and education? Yes, it is possible. Many people don't murder, don't do drugs. Decent people, according to human standards. But can a person who's born with a sinful nature fulfill the greatest commandment in the Bible, the first and greatest commandment in the Bible, to love God with all your heart, soul, and strength? This means to love God above all. Can a sinful person do that? Impossible. Zero chance. Zero chance. And guess what? To break the first and greatest commandment, that is the essence of sin. That is the heart of sin. And not only that, to break this commandment is the gateway to all other sins. Because a person loves something more than God, that person is willing to disobey God's commandments to get what he or she wants. That is why this is a gateway to all other sins. And because of this sinful nature, this propensity to not love God, to disobey the first and greatest commandment, every person will inevitably decay morally and become worse and worse. And the trajectory of that person's life without God it's going to be filled with all kinds of evils. Before I was a Christian, I saw that trajectory in front of me in my life. If God removes all restraints from a person, that person can become the devil. A person without God will most likely follow whatever is popular in society. If society says LGBTQ is great, then the person most likely will follow that. See, every single person born on this earth has a sinful nature, has a propensity to disobey the first and greatest commandment, and is decay morally, and has the potential to commit all kinds of evil. Every single person is under the righteous judgment of God. And God cannot be bribed. Exodus 34, 6 says that as a righteous God, he will by no means Clear the guilty. God must judge sinners or else he is not a righteous judge. Now, I believe that there are a lot of Christians in Indonesia also believe everyone's born innocent. This is why a lot of churches in Indonesia do not even preach the gospel. They do not even teach about sin and the need to repent and submit to God. Many Christians believe that people are just born basically good. We're just a little bit broken. And all they need in life is just some good coaching to become better people. Now, of course, it's important to be nice. God commands us to love others. But if we just love others and not love God, which is very easy. You know, it's easy to, not, to love people and not offend people. Just don't share the gospel. You won't offend anybody. But if we do not love others by sharing the gospel with them, we're not being loving. You're just going to let people do whatever they want, even when they commit great sins. If we do not tell them that God is offended by our sins, then we're not being, we're not being loving. Now, to these people, Jesus is just 
a great teacher. There are many Christians who think that we are basically born good, but we're just kind of lost in life. And all we need is just some good purpose, good coaching, good direction in our lives. To these people, Jesus is just a great teacher. And great teacher of what? You just fill in the blanks. He's a great teacher of psychology who can help us to have better relationships with each other. Or he's a great teacher of life, a great life coach who can help us to be better leaders. Or he's a great motivator who can motivate us to fulfill all our dreams. Brothers and sisters, these messages are not the gospel. There's no salvation in these messages. They are just human efforts and moralism. They cannot save us. We are sinful people who constantly disobey God's first and greatest commandment. And we deserve God's righteous judgment on us. That's the bad news. That's the problem. Everybody knows that if you have a problem and you want to solve that problem, the first step is to admit that you have a problem. If you don't admit that you have a problem, then your problem will never be solved. If we do not admit that we have a problem with God, then our problem with God will never be solved. We have a sin problem, and the only solution is Jesus. This is a good news during this Christmas. The sacrificial system in the Old Testament taught the Jews that God is a righteous God who must judge sinners. And there's only forgiveness of sins when there is a death of an animal, which was a substitute for the sinner. Hebrews 9, 9 verses 22 says this, Indeed, under the law, that is the Mosaic law, Almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. These animals were just pointing to the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus, who is the Lamb of God who takes away our sins. In Romans 3, 23, 26 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You see the passage, passage is saying that in the past, it seemed like God was unjust. He did not punish the sins of his people in the Old Testament. David committed murder, but God did not punish him. So it looked like God was being unjust. But this passage is saying that no, God is just. He has sent Christ to cover for their sins and to cover our sins when we trust in him. This is the reason why Jesus was born. He became our substitute to pay the penalty of our sins. And to deny that Jesus is God is to deny salvation for us. We must believe that Christ is God. In order to receive this gift of salvation, a sinner must believe and accept Jesus as his as his Savior and Lord, and submit to Jesus. You cannot just accept Jesus as your teacher. You must accept him as your Lord and submit to him because he is the king of the world. If you have no desire to submit to him, then you have no salvation. You must receive him as both your Savior and your Lord. Now, for those of you who have not received Jesus, I urge you to receive him during this Christmas season. He is God's best gift for you. His kingdom is far better than this broken world. Do not let 
the pleasures of sin deceive you. It doesn't fulfill you now, and when you are judged by God, it will not fulfill you later. Come and taste the goodness of Christ. Receive him as your Savior and Lord. Now, according to God's revelation to uh, Joseph, the first purpose of Jesus' incarnation is to fulfill God's promise of salvation. The second purpose is to fulfill God's promise of closeness to us. This is in verses 22 to 23. The incarnation of Jesus took place in order to fulfill God's prophecy about God living with us face to face again. It's the fulfillment of God's prophecy in Isaiah 7.14. You see, in the very beginning, mankind was meant to live with God face to face in paradise on earth. Adam and Eve had unhindered access to God's physical presence. But after they sinned against God, they were banished from Eden, Eden, and they were banished from God's physical presence. Ever since then, God has been on a mission to restore his physical, physical presence with us. And when God called the nation of Israel to worship him, he commanded them to build a temple. And this temple was fashioned like the Garden of Eden. That's why there were a lot of flowers and animals in that temple. And the temple was a representation of God's physical presence. But that's not enough because it was not the very physical presence of God. So God was still on a mission to restore his full physical presence with us. This is why God prophesied in Isaiah 7:14 that a child will be born through a virgin, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. It's the very physical presence of God with us. Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy. And this prophecy in Isaiah 7:14 took place in the context of the rebellion of the southern kingdom, Judah. And when they were rebelling, God said to the king, Ahaz, in verse 13, he says this, Hear then, O house of David, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall, bear, uh, shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So God gave this sign of a virgin birth to not just the evil king Ahaz, but to all the house of David in every generation, the dynasty of David in every generation, and to the larger whole nation of Israel. He was not just talking to Ahaz. Because in, the, in verse 14, the pronoun you is actually plural. It's plural in Hebrew. You can't tell in English because English doesn't differentiate between singular and plural. But it's very clear in Hebrew, it's plural. So he's not just talking to Ahaz, but to all the generations of the house of David and to the larger society of Israel. Now, the fulfillment of this prophecy took place 700 years before Christ was born. So Ahaz and his generation never saw this fulfillment. Now, you may be thinking, now, what kind of miracle is that? What kind of sign is that if they were not, if they were not able to see the fulfillment, believe, and encourage them to obey? How does that work? Well, this is because God wants the Jews in the Old Testament to live in light of eternity, in light of God's eternal kingdom, even though they couldn't see it. You see, it's very common in the Old Testament for prophets to use their events that occur in their lifetime to prophesy about the future eternal kingdom of God so that Old Testament believers will live in light of eternity. That's why God gave this sign to them, even though they couldn't see it. And this is what God does for us in many, in many ways, for Christians. In the New Testament, we are exhorted to live our lives now in light of God's eternal kingdom in the future, even though we cannot see it. So that is why 
God gave this sign to Ahaz. But God was gracious. Uh, he didn't just give this one sign. He gave another sign in Isaiah 8, 3, which was a sign about Isaiah's son. And God prophesied that before the son can even talk, the northern kingdom and the kingdom of Syria will be exiled. And that's exactly what happened. They saw it. They should have believed and obeyed God, but they continued to disobey God. Then later on in Isaiah 9, 6, God again prophesied about the birth of the Son of God, this Messiah, and made it clear that the child would be God. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And what's the amazing thing is that the word wonderful here translates the Hebrew Pele. It literally means miraculous. And what's amazing is that this same title was given to the angel of the Lord in Judges 13 to 18. I remember Bat Yusa mentioned last week how God the Son appeared physically in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord. Angel just means messenger. He's a messenger of, of the Lord. And it's very fitting that in the New Testament, he's called the Word of God because he's the perfect revelation of God himself. So in Judges 13, 18, when Manoah asked the angel, the messenger of God, for his name, the messenger said, is what? Wonderful. So this is a clear connection, indication that Jesus, the Son of God, appear physically in the Old Testament in a physical way before his incarnation in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, he did not appear in the form of a human, but in the form of some angelic nature. I don't know. We don't know what it looks like, but we know it's different from a human body. But in the New Testament, he took on the human body through a virgin. You see, the incarnation of the Son of God is necessary for God to restore His physical presence with us. That's why God prophesies and fulfills this prophecy. Our salvation is not just getting a get-out-of-hell car. It's about being restored to the physical presence of God where we can see Him, experience His full love in His kingdom. That is salvation. This is what believers in the Old Testament have longed for since humankind was kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And we should also long for this day when we can see Christ physically, where we can experience His full love in His kingdom, where there's no death, there's no suffering, no COVID, no mask, no poverty, no tears, and that's going to happen in the new heaven and the new earth, where there's no need for another temple because the very physical presence of God will be with us. And you know what? What's amazing thing about Jesus' incarnation is that it's not temporary. It's forever. He doesn't just put on a human body and it just takes it off. He puts it on forever. Hebrews 7, 17 says, Jesus is the priest forever after the word of Melchizedek. Guess what a priest is? Priest, by definition, is a human being. He's going to be a human being, a priest forever. This is amazing love of God. And when I first discovered that Jesus' incarnation is forever, not temporary. I was blown away by that love. Now, can you imagine? We are lowly human beings. How incredible it is to think that the God of heaven and earth would come down to take on a human body to become one of us and live in this broken world to suffer and die for us. That is just unbelievable love. 
to be one of us, one of his creatures. It will be like the king of England giving up the glory and the comfort of his palace to come to Jakarta to live in a slum with the people of the slum. How amazing, how humble, how incredible that love is. Now, the king of England will never do that, but that's exactly what Christ has done for us, even to a greater degree, to live with us forever. Brothers and sisters, this doctrine of the incarnation of Jesus is very important for our spiritual life now because it empowers us to obey the first and greatest commandment. We can never fulfill this commandment if we don't have any hope of fellowshipping with God face to face. I remember when I was a young Christian, I kept hearing sermons about we have to love God above all. And that bothered me because I was thinking, how can I accomplish that when I can't even see God? Now, that's a hard thing to do. Now, you know, imagine you have a best friend, and this best friend is the most important person, the most amazing person in the world, and you tell everybody about it. And then everybody asks you, well, where's your best friend, and what does he or she looks like? And you say, I don't know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's very strange, right? That's very strange. And, and by the way, Jesus does not look like a white European guy with long hair, okay? That, it really bothers me when he's depicted that way. He looked like a Jewish dark person with short, dark hair. And, and Isaiah 53 verse 2 tells us that he wasn't a good-looking man. He was just an ordinary-looking man. I'm not sure what he will look like when he returns, but we need, we need to long to see the physical presence of Christ. Because it's a very strange thing to say to somebody that you have the most important person in the world and you can't even see that person. Well, you don't even have the hope of seeing that person. We human beings, we cannot operate like that. We cannot love someone without seeing the person, especially when we are called to love God with all our hearts. For us to love someone To love God in that way, we must have the hope of seeing Him face to face one day. Now, when I realized that I would see God face to face one day, that gave me the spiritual power to fulfill the first and greatest commandment, even though I couldn't see Him now. I live by faith now, but one day my faith will turn into sight, and I will see God in human flesh like one of us. It's important to believe in this incarnation and long to see Christ in order to fulfill the first and greatest commandment. This is why in 1 John 3, 2, and verse 3, it says, We shall see him as he is. We as Christians, him here is meaning Christ. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So to deny that Jesus is God doesn't just destroy our salvation, but it destroys our ability to love and live for Christ now, right here, right now. And to deny that Jesus is God is to deny and dishonor God's incredible love for us. This Christmas season, we must remember the deity of Christ and how much he has suffered a sacrifice for us. Now, also, if we deny that Jesus is God, then we are actually worshiping an idol. We pray to Jesus. When you pray to someone, you are considering that person to be divine because only God can hear our prayers from far away and have the power to grant our wishes. No human beings can do that. We cannot pray to any human being, no matter how godly the person is and no matter how powerful that person is. 
We cannot worship, pray to any human being. Now, in ancient times, it was very common for people to deify and worship the dead. The Roman Empire used to deify dead embers. And people in many societies worship their ancestors by praying to them. Now, Jesus is not a deified human being. He's not a man who became God. He's eternal God who became a man. It's very strange to pray to worship dead human beings. And I'm sure that all of you have been at a deathbed of somebody whom you love. I was at a deathbed of my grandpa, and he was the, at his weakest moment of his life. He couldn't even talk. I wasn't even sure if he could understand me. I can't imagine that after he dies, he becomes a God, and I should pray to him. It's so strange to think that death, which is something bad, can enable someone to become God, to have the ability to hear from us from far away and grant our wishes. It's nonsense. That is why some of the Roman emperors even talked sarcastically about their deification because they knew it was nonsense. And we cannot worship, pray to any human being. Jesus is God. We pray and worship him alone. And if we actually think that we can pray to a dead human person, we have a very low view of God. And we're comparing the Almighty God to a dead human person. Now imagine if the world champion in weightlifting is in front of you, and you go up to him and compliment him and say, Wow, you are so strong. You are so strong like a little baby. Do you think he'll be offended? Yes, yes, he will be offended. Now imagine you go to God and say, God, you are so mighty, you're like a dead human person. Do you think God will be offended? Yes, he will be offended. We can only worship God, not a dead human person. Don't have a low view of God. Jesus is 100% God, 100% man. We worship and pray to him alone. Now, after God revealed his will to Joseph in a dream, Joseph immediately obeyed God and took Mary as his wife. This is in verses 24 to 25. And it tells us that uh, Jesus was born in this passage. And before he was born, Joseph did not sleep with Mary because this is to fulfill the prophecy that not just a virgin will conceive, but a virgin will give birth to a son. And this shows us the incredible character of Joseph. He had great self-control. He was sexually active, but he refrained himself for many months in order to obey God's command. And this also shows us the character of God. He knows our hearts. He knows the heart of Joseph. He entrusted him to fulfill his prophecy. You see, God's in total control of history. He knows all our hearts. We can believe, we can trust Him to obey, we can trust Him to fulfill all prophecies. Now, friends, it is clear that Jesus is God, and He's offering salvation to all of you here if you have not received Him during this Christmas season. I urge you, if you have not received Christ, receive Him. Enter in his kingdom, experience his love and his kindness to you. And for those of you who have received Christ, I want to ask, how is your joy during this Christmas season? Have, you be, have your heart become dull? Is it just about gifts and other things? Now, have you lost your love for Christ? I urge you to respond properly to God's love through Christ by giving thanks to Him every day, especially during this Christmas season. Now, I want to challenge you, get up every morning. The first thing you do is get down on your knees and praise God, thank God in your prayer. 
And when you do this for a long time, the Holy Spirit will change your heart. It's a time of celebration, giving thanks for Christ. Praise God. It's very important for Christians to be thankful because it's very easy to be unthankful. We live in a broken world after all. There's always something to complain about. There's always something to be unthankful about. But take heart. Christ has conquered the world. Live for his kingdom. He has overcome. He will give us his eternal kingdom. So we have to practice thankfulness. Now, for those who are living with a thankful heart to God, I want to ask you, how are you living out this thankfulness to Christ? You know, Christ could just stay in heaven, enjoy his comfort and glory in heaven, and not come down to this earth. But that's not what he did. He gave up and sacrificed his comfort and glory to come down to this earth, to be with us, to love us, despite all our issues, all our problems, all our brokenness, to love us, to be patient with us, to be kind with us, to be gentle with us. Now, are we following him? Are we imitating his love? You know, we could just stay in our home, just enjoy our leisure, play video games all day, watch TV all day. But if we do that, we're not following Christ. We're not living out our thankfulness to Christ. So if you're not living out following Christ, I urge you to live out your life, to be thankful for Christ. Don't play video games all day. Look around you. Those who do not know the gospel, love them, be salt and light, and share the gospel with them. Be like Christ, especially during this Christmas season. Honor him, give thanks to him. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for your loving kindness through Christ. Thank you, Christ, that you have loved us eternally by taking on human flesh forever. It is so amazing. Lord, we do not deserve this love. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will strengthen us Fill our heart with the love of Christ. Live in joy and demonstrate this love as we fellowship with others and share the gospel with others. May you be honored and glorified in our life. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.